All right, folks, I'm ready to go. I hope you guys are too. Let's get this underway. A uh, couple just general things to, to, to get things started. This class, more than any other, has uh, been taking advantage of my office hours. I, you know, in past offerings of the course, I'll see like two students over the course of the semester. This year I've seen a couple dozen, so I don't know what's different here, but it's pretty cool. I'm getting to know some of you, and for those of you who haven't stopped by to see me during my office hours, you're missing out. It's a party in there, right? Um, and I also, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit hurt, right, because I understand that uh, Lauren Ralph, the supplemental instructor's uh, virtual office hour, was very popular, right? I have yet to have one person actually log in to participate in my virtual office hours. I think, I think I've got everything working on my end, uh, but uh, nobody has shown up. So for those of you who are staying home in your pajamas and watching this only on the Tegrity recordings, this is your chance, right? Uh, before each class, uh, go to Pilot Live and you'll be able to log in to the virtual office hours that I have there, and we can talk that way with you still staying in your pajamas at home in bed if you like to do that. Um, after the lecture on Tuesday, I've had a number of people that, uh, whose curiosity I seem to have piqued with uh, my mentioning of my iPhone or I, uh, iTunes playlist, right? And, uh, if you had come to my virtual office hours this morning, you would have been able to hear the playlist playing in the background. So while nothing else was going on, I had some songs playing, and that would have been a way to firsthand figure out what it is that I have on my playlist. Um, all right, so here's the deal. Um, we're at the part of the course now where I'm focusing on the energy inside of cells, right? I told you in class on Tuesday that for prokaryotes, that's pretty much it, right? That's the, that's the main thing that causes one prokaryotic organism to be able to outcompete another prokaryotic organism, is how well they collect energy, how well they store energy, and then how well they utilize energy. And I think when I say well there, I think we could substitute how efficiently they collect energy, how efficiently they store energy, how efficiently they use energy. That's what decides uh, that's the basis upon which natural selection is going to be acting uh, to determine which prokaryotic organisms will survive and which ones will not. That's a big deal from an evolutionary perspective. We only see the winners of these competitions, and these competitions have been going on for a billion years, and what we see then are organisms that are incredibly well adapted to collecting, storing, and using energy. Right? So this is a hugely important principle concept from the perspective of at least bacterial life, prokaryotic organisms. It certainly has a lot of important implications for eukaryotes as well. We're pretty efficient, but we play by a slightly different set of rules, and that'll become clearer as we get into the third part of this course. But for now, again, we're focused on energy, and energy is a really big deal for, for living systems, particularly for prokaryotic systems. And the study of energy in chemical systems has a fancy name. It's a discipline in its own right. The study of energy in a chemical system is the study of thermodynamics. And so pretty much all that I did on Tuesday was give you a Reader's Digest version of a year-long thermodynamics chemistry class that you probably wouldn't see until you're a junior, more likely until you're a senior, right? So in some sense, this is pretty complicated, heady stuff, but I think I was able to give it to you in a way that not only makes sense of it, but makes it useful from the perspective of understanding what's going on with a biological system. And so this is the lecture outline that I used on Tuesday. Turns out it's the same lecture outline that I want to use today because I want to just go back and remind you of you know, the bottom line for a couple of these things. And now that I've had a chance to expose it to you, you know, 
in a sort of superficial way, there are a couple places where I think I can go a little bit deeper with you now to get you a deeper understanding. And when all is said and done, at the end of the day today, I'm going to roll up my sleeves, maybe literally if I continue to sweat the way I am right now. But we'll talk about what's up with enzymes and get in a little more detail about how it is that enzymes work the magic that enzymes work and how it is that cells can control the activity of enzymes as well. But again, that's at the end of the day, that's the, that's the big payoff that we're shooting for. Before we get there, let me remind you about the two most important laws of thermodynamics, the first and the second law of thermodynamics. The first law is you're nuts if you think you can get a machine running forever without inputting energy to keep that, those wheels moving. In, in chemical terms, energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Right? So there's a finite amount of energy associated with the system, and you can't expect energy to just sort of coalesce or you know, you know, collect itself in a neat little spot that's convenient for living things or even non-living things. Energy doesn't do that. There's a finite amount of energy, and it doesn't just materialize out of nowhere. It's intrinsic to the system, and you can't make it, and by the same token, you can't destroy it. All right? So in a closed system, energy, and matter for that matter, can neither be created nor destroyed. The second law of thermodynamics is the one I think I talked with you about the most on Tuesday. From biological perspectives, you know, the first one is, I think we can just accept that, right? I think we can, we're comfortable in, in just our day-to-day -day lives knowing that dollar bills don't just magically appear in your wallet or purse. Right? That, that just doesn't happen unless you've got a, you know, a secret benefactor somewhere uh, that's slipping you some 50s once in a while. Right? That, for most of us, that's just not happening. And, and that's the equivalent of you know, energy does, doesn't spontaneously present itself to a living thing. But it's this second law of thermodynamics that is also in play that's probably a little harder for us to wrap our heads around because it seems that it, you know, at a first pass, really outrageous. The bottom line for the second law of thermodynamics is, is that when you transfer energy from one place to another, any kind of transfer from one place or one form to another, from one covalent bond to another covalent bond, whatever, no matter how you transfer energy, there's this entropy that has to occur. There has to be an increase in disorder and or temperature whenever you transfer energy from one thing to another thing. And I suppose at a first pass, that's not too outrageous. OK, I can accept that. Disorder happens. Fine. OK. It's just how much disorder happens that I think it's hard for us as people to wrap our heads around. The analogy I used with you on Tuesday was, you know, what if you go to your bank, you got a $100 bill, you want some $1 bills so you can buy soft drinks out of the vending machines, right? How would you feel if the bank gave you 25 $1 bills for every $100 bill you gave them and, and didn't bat an eye and thought, yeah, here you go. That's, that's the exchange that we're doing. I mean, I, I, I would be flabbergasted. I wouldn't even know what to say to the bank teller who gave me 25 $1 bills after I gave them a $100 bill. I'm not even sure how to start that discussion. It's so hard for me to appreciate you know, that level of outrageousness in terms of the transfer that's going on, the exchange that's taking place. And yet, that's how extreme this entropy tax, as I've described it, is. When living things are trying to move energy from the covalent bonds stored in glucose to the covalent bonds stored in ATP, for instance, the expectation is that on the order of two-thirds of that energy is lost through increased entropy rather than the creation of high-energy bonds associated with ATP. Right, so that's the conversion rate that we're getting for living things, converting energy stored in glucose's bonds to energy stored in ATP's bonds. And that's actually crazy good, you know, 
we've had really good negotiations as living things going on with nature over the past billion years or so. Much better, apparently, than the engineers who are trying to design car engines have been able to come up with so far, where 25% efficiency for the energy transfer is pretty darn good. It's about the state of the art at the present time. So that second law of thermodynamics is a killer. All right, it, it, it's, a, it's got a huge consequence. And just with that second law of thermodynamics in mind, I've been telling you that prokaryotes really keep their eye on that ball of energy. That's like their main job number one is let's do a good job with energy. Given what a killer the second law of thermodynamics is, don't you think that prokaryotic organisms in particular would go way out of their way to avoid those sorts of things that, for which that tax would apply? Right? And that's actually something that we see. Prokaryotic organisms don't just willy-nilly try to transfer energy from glucose to ATP and then from ATP back to glucose. Sure, they could do that. They have the enzymes set up to run those reactions. But they don't, except when they really need to, because it's just wasteful every time you try and do one of those types of transfer, okay? So that second law of thermodynamics rears its head all the time when you're looking at strategies that organisms are taking. Now, just a word or two more about spontaneous reactions. Um, the word spontaneous says it all. This is a reaction that's gonna take place in and of itself, you know, by its own accord, these are chemical reactions that will occur. The reactions that occur naturally without any nudging, without any sort of manipulation by a living system or by a chemist, those spontaneous reactions are ones where you go from a high state of energy associated with the system to a lower state of energy. That's what makes it spontaneous. It's all determined by the energy profile of the system. You go from high energy to low energy. You never go from low energy to high energy. That's just not the way that the world works. So this is a graphic that shows you that. Here we've got a spontaneous reaction. If you want to be fancy, you can call it an exergonic reaction where the reactants go from high levels of energy, this gives free energy, to products that have a low level of energy or a lower level of energy. And along the way, energy is released. Often, well, in, in always, most of that energy is released in terms of increasing the entropy of the system, the temperature and or the disorder. And so what happens then is if somebody tells you that a particular chemical reaction has a positive delta G, in chemistry and thermodynamics lingo, positive delta G translates immediately to ain't gonna happen, okay? Positive delta G, when, when you go, that, what that means is the final state of the energy has, the, there's more energy associated with the final state than the initial state. That just can't happen. So a negative delta G is something that you is, expect then, you know, on paper, it looks like this is something that can happen of its own accord. Without any manipulation, it'll take place. So spontaneous reactions have negative delta Gs. The reactants start at high energy and the products end at low energy. I keep saying reactant and I keep saying product because that's some jargon that I understand some of you who haven't had chemistry classes before haven't been exposed to, and yet I'm gonna ex expect on exams and in lectures that you guys will know what I'm talking about. A reactant, I'll sometimes say substrate. Substrate and reactant are equivalent terms to me. Reactants or substrates are where the molecules start at the beginning of the process. The product is the way the molecules are at the end of the process. So I won't give you that definition again, but I'll say those words a lot. Now, these spontaneous reactions are in contrast to the cleverly named non-spontaneous reactions, or if you want to be fancy, the endergonic reactions. It's just the opposite. 
Here, we're talking about a delta G that's positive, okay? In chemical lingo, a thermodynamics guy is gonna be thinking in his head, ain't gonna happen, okay? And what has to happen for an endergonic reaction is to be able to get the reactants from their low energy state to products with a higher energy state, it can't happen unless something is infusing energy into that system. And again, the second law of thermodynamics is going to apply. The energy that gets infused in the system needs to be accompanied by a lot more energy that is going to be lost in terms of increasing the entropy of the system, increasing the temperature or the disorder, okay? So, if reactions that have a positive delta G ain't gonna happen, how is it that we make things like glucose molecules in the first place? Because the chemical reaction for photosynthesis, the end result of photosynthesis, which we'll talk about a week from today, the end result of photosynthesis is pretty simply this. You take carbon dioxide gas and water and you pump them up with energy to convert them into glucose and oxygen gas. So we're going from things, molecules that have relatively little energy associated with them to a molecule, glucose, that has a lot of energy associated with it. And actually oxygen gas is pretty energy rich as well. How does that happen? How does photosynthesis pull that off? The way that photosynthesis is able to occur is that we're going from these reactants with low energy to products with high energy by pumping in, capturing, harnessing, pumping in energy in large amounts. A lot more than gets captured in the products because again, a lot of that energy is gonna be lost is increased temperature or increased disorder. And the long and the short of it is that the way you get non-spontaneous reactions to take place in a living system is by coupling, and I use that word deliberately and with emphasis, by coupling the non-spontaneous reaction to a spontaneous reaction that's even more energetically favorable than the non-spontaneous reaction is energetically unfavorable. That's the trick that living things are doing all the time. We get nature to allow us to make some things more organized, more ordered, to store energy and chemical bonds, ultimately by cutting the steel where we say to nature, okay, right here I wanna have some more order, but the price I'm willing to pay is a lot more disorder somewhere else. Okay, so for cells, let's talk about cellular energy. Here's glucose again. Same picture I've shown you a couple times now of the structure of glucose. I've tried to indoctrinate you. I've tried to brainwash you with these structures. I'm trying to get you, when somebody flashes a picture like this at you, to stop thinking about what's for lunch, all right, and instead to have this message pop up in your head, oh wow, look at that structure. This is, a, this is something that's water soluble. Right? That's the first sort of subliminal message I've been trying to implant and trick your guys' brains into seeing when you see a structure like that. But I want to really focus your attention now on the second sort of background message that I also have been trying to get to trick you guys into having in your head when you see a structure like that. I hope you recognize glucose is water soluble. It's water soluble because you have all these polar bonds, right? There's one, there's one over there, well, there's that one, there's one. Right? That's what's making it water soluble. But move past that to the next thing, and that is there are a boatload of high energy bonds here. And I tell you what, let me take 10 seconds and let's just count the number of high energy bonds. Remember, a high energy bond is a covalent bond between two atoms that are sharing electrons pretty evenly. Hydrogen and carbon, when they're involved with covalent bonds with each other, are sharing their electrons pretty evenly. Those electrons are far away from either of the two atomic nuclei. They're high up in the atmosphere, if you want to think about it in those terms. They have more energy than the electrons that are held close to those atomic nuclei. So how many high energy bonds, how many high energy bonds are there? One, there's one, carbon to carbon is going to be high energy. So one, two, three, four, five, 
6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. All right? I might have missed one or two, but that sounds about right to me. That's a boatload. That's a bunch. It's more high energy bonds than I can count with on the, hand, the fingers of my two hands. All right? that's, a, that's a lot of high energy bonds. This is an energy rich molecule. I just want you to appreciate that. That molecule's got a lot of energy associated with it. And I told you specifically, if you want to talk in terms of calories, 686,000 calories per mole of glucose. And I used the word on Tuesday, if you burned glucose. And I literally had in my mind a mental picture of taking a match and holding uh, you know, a pound of sugar and getting that sugar to burn with the match. That would release 686,000 calories of energy if you burned that sugar. Turns out sugar doesn't burn that well. It does, right? But it doesn't burn that well. But you know what happens when you burn something? You're essentially, well, for glucose, you're converting those sugar molecules and oxygen gas into carbon dioxide and water, okay? And along the way, you release a bunch of energy in a big poof of energy coming out. It won't be too long before those of you with a fireplace will be cuddling up or huddling up around a fireplace in another, what, month and a half, probably. There'll be snow in, and we'll want to start working on it. You know what's going on there? The wood is made mostly of glucose, right? That's what cellulose is, right? It's made mostly of glucose, and literally what, literally what you're doing there is you're burning the wood in the same way that cells could be extracting energy from glucose. So these are energy-rich molecules. We use them in a fireplace to give rise to heat. We use them in cells also to give rise to heat, but we're more interested in extracting some of that energy to make other bonds that we think are more useful to us. And so here is the dollar bill of the cell's energy currency, ATP, where the energy is stored in, in this molecule is primarily where the arrow happens to be pointing. It's in this bond here that uh, we're investing or extracting some energy. Now, if you look at the rest of the structure, again, this is adenosine triphosphate. It's the same molecule that's used to make DNA. Uh, and there are a whole bunch of energy-rich bonds in the rest of the structure. We're not breaking these parts down when we're talking about using ATP for energy purposes. We're talking about releasing one of these phosphate groups to convert ATP to ADP and inorganic phosphate. Those phosphate groups have negative charges. To be able to hold them together, you need to have some pretty energy-rich covalent bonds. Otherwise, they would naturally pull apart because of those negative charges. When you release one of those phosphate groups, you release some energy, and it makes nature feel good because you've reduced the amount of clustering of those negative charges. And so what happens when you go from ATP to ADP in inorganic phosphate, you bring in one water molecule, and you release some energy. Specifically, you release a little bit more than seven kilocalories of energy per mole of ATP that gets converted to ADP and inorganic phosphate. All right. Now, I flashed this at you a little bit in class on Tuesday. Let's talk about this just a little bit more now. Uh, what we have here is a diagram that is showing you the way that cells go about making glutamine, a specific chemical compound that we need, okay? It's actually an amino acid. And so that's how we go about making glutamine is this process. We combine glutamic acid and ammonia to get glutamine. Now that process has a positive delta G, okay? Put on your thermodynamics uh, thinking hats here, right? I said positive delta G. That should translate, that should trigger some sort of signal in your head that says, ain't gonna happen, right? Positive delta G 
just not something you should be expecting to happen in a typical cell. It just ain't going to happen. Not energetically favorable. It's like it's as likely to happen as a ball sitting down here, rolling up to the top of the stairs. All right? That's not going to happen. This chemical reaction's not going to happen. Not a spontaneous reaction. But, the, but cells need this reaction to occur, all right? We need glutamine to be able to make our proteins. We got to have it. And so how are we going to get it? How are we going to pull off the trick of getting the ball from the bottom of the stairs to the top of the stairs? Well, the way we would get a ball from the bottom of the stairs to the top of the stairs is somebody's going to have to invest some energy in that ball. Somebody's going to have to expend some energy to pull that off. It might be me that picks up the ball and burns the calories walking all the way to the top of the stairs and sets it down. Or it might be me that picks up the ball and throws it to the top of the stairs. But somebody, me here, is doing all the work. You guys are just sitting around, right? I'm working up a sweat down here. Somebody's got to do the work to get the ball up to the top of the stairs because it's not going to happen by itself. Well, the way that cells are going to get this molecule that they need is by expending some energy. The same way I have to expend energy to get the ball to the top of the stairs, cells have to expend energy to hook together glutamic acid and ammonia. Right? And the energy is going to be delivered by the $1 bill of the energy currency of living things, and that's ATP. There's a price that's going to be paid. For every glutamine that the cell wants to have made, it's going to need to expect to expend, I'll use the word burn, an ATP. It's a one-to-one -one sort of relationship. To get ammonia associated with glutamic acid, you got to expend an ATP. You're cashing in one of those 7.2 kcal per mole bonds to drive that process. At the end of the process, look what happens. We've got what we were wanting, glutamine, but we also have ADP and inorganic phosphate. Look at how the energy, the energy works out now. The reaction that we're interested in has an unfavorable delta G. The reaction that we're using to drive the process has a more favorable delta G, a negative delta G, and you put the two together, you kind of couple them, you marry them together by having an enzyme facilitate this process. When you couple them, the net delta G is negative. So if you can pull this off, you can expect that chemical reaction to take place spontaneously. Spontaneously in the sense that an enzyme facilitated the whole process. An enzyme took a little bundle of energy and used that energy to smush together glutamic acid and ammonia such that at the end of the process, you end up with the molecule that you wanted. Okay? Wouldn't have happened if the energy hadn't been expended because, again, without that energy expenditure that smushes them together, this is not a spontaneous process. Notice also the efficiency of this process. About half of the energy in that ATP actually got used to do some useful work. Where did the other half go? Where you the accounting here? What's up, right? For an accountancy kind of you know major, what would they be thinking? You know. Minus 3.9 kcals per mole. Where's that? What happened to that? In a word, the second law of thermodynamics. That's not one word, it's what, five. But <laughs> in a word, the second law of thermodynamics has reared its head here in this process. That 3.9 kcals per mole has been lost as heat and or disorder to the system. Okay. So when you look at this, I hope it all sort of ties together and makes some sense. There's two principles that are really in play here. 
One is the first law of thermodynamics that says you're not going to get this reaction to occur spontaneously. You're not suddenly going to, you can't just expect these two things with low energy to come together in a way that makes them have a higher energy. Not going to happen. Why? Ultimately, the first law of thermodynamics. And if you do facilitate it, right, by linking that reaction that by itself wouldn't have happened to another reaction that's more likely to have happened, you have to expect that entropy is going to kick in. The second law of thermodynamics is going to kick in, and you'll increase the disorder of the system as a result. Right? So in one image here, we see ways to illustrate or draw attention to both the first and the second law of thermodynamics. All right, let's talk about what's up with these enzymes. <clears throat> enzymes are wondrous things. Uh, we have, uh, in biological systems, most enzymes are proteins, okay? The vast majority are proteins. There are some enzymatic activities associated with RNA. There are some enzymatic activities that are associated with just some other chemicals that are present inside of cells. But when we're talking about enzymes in a freshman biology class, we're talking about proteins. Okay? And that's what's getting the work done inside of a cell. A typical cell will have on the order of 500 to 1,000 enzymes that are present that are marshalling and shepherding all of its chemical reactions. As a human being, your body is actually capable of making on the order of a quarter million different proteins most of which are enzymes. And so different cell types will have different enzymes to give those cell types the, the ability to do the special things that those cells do. Brain cells need to be able to catalyze some chemical reactions that liver cells don't, right? But at the end of the day, we're looking to proteins to act as enzymes that are catalysts of reactions. An enzyme is just a fancy word for a biological catalyst. So catalysts occur in all sorts of non-protein kind of ways, but biological catalysts we call enzymes, okay? And they're proteins. The way that enzymes or any other catalyst does its magic is by helping reactants or substrates get to products faster than they would have of their own accord. Enzymes do nothing at all to change the delta G of a reaction. So an enzyme is no, is no better able to help a non-spontaneous reaction take place than the non-spontaneous reaction could take place on its own. Enzymes have no effect on delta G. Right? I don't think you guys are taking that seriously enough. An enzyme doesn't change the bottom line energy associated with a chemical reaction. It can't change something that was non-spontaneous into spontaneous. That can't happen. Enzymes don't do that. What enzymes do is they make it easier for substrates or reactants, again, equivalent terms for me, they make it easier for reactants to pass through this transition state that all spontaneous reactions need to pass through so that they can make the transition to the lower product state. Right? Enzymes are all about gaming this. Enzymes manipulate what's called the activation energy of the chemical reaction that they're catalyzing. And I can say it more broadly. Catalysts reduce the activation energy of the chemical reactions that they catalyze, okay? This transition state is something that people seem to wrestle with. They have a hard time coming to grips with, well, why do you have to pass through a transition state? Well, maybe one way to think about it is this. I think we should be thankful that molecules need to pass through a transition state. Otherwise, I mean, I hate to break it to you, but your bodies are full of glucose. 
There's a lot of energy stored in the covalent bonds of that glucose. There's a lot of oxygen all around us, right? I'm telling you, the delta G is huge. It's, you, any of you ever hear of spontaneous combustion? Maybe these people have had an issue that you know, none of the rest of us want to have because there's, if not for that transition state, if not for the need to pass through the transition state, glucose in the presence of oxygen would poof, explode. They'd combust and release all of that energy like that. Very inconvenient to us as organisms if any time a glucose bumps into an oxygen, it burns and releases all that energy. Hugely inconvenient to us. The reason that we have glucose that can exist in the presence of oxygen is that it turns out to be able to get the glucose and the oxygen, if you will, to become carbon dioxide and water and release all that energy is you got to juice up the system a little bit. You have to, I use the phrase, prime the pump. You have to excite the chemical bonds in the glucose to make them wiggle in just the right way such that they're vulnerable to then interacting with the oxygen molecules. All right? The way that you prime the pump in a uh, fireplace is with a match. Right? You start the process off, you increase the energy associated with the wood to the point where it can become a self-sustaining sort of fire. The match is helping you get, you're, you're priming the pump, you're at a small spot on the wood, you're increasing the energy that's associated with the system so that at that small spot on the wood, those molecules achieve, the, they pass into the transition state, they wiggle in just the right way that the oxygen can combine with them, and then it's all downhill from there. You release all that energy, and all that energy that comes out of that release can then be used to fuel other molecules getting into the transition state, and you're off to the races, and you have a burning log. Okay? So, the reason glucose doesn't spontaneously combust is because you need to invest some energy to get the glucose excited enough such that it can pass through this transition state and then fall down into the products. Again, enzymes have no effect on the delta G, the difference between the energy of the substrates and the products. Instead, what they do is they manipulate the amount of activation energy that's required. So for the reaction I've just been talking about, the combustion of glucose, you need a certain amount of activation energy. They're shown in black. If an enzyme is catalyzing the reaction, or if any catalyst is catalyzing the reaction, what's going to happen is that you'll pass through the transition state with less energy needing to be invested in the process. That's how enzymes work. That's how catalysts work they reduce the activation energy. Again, the delta G isn't changed at all. You're still getting the same amount of net release of energy, but you got there without having to go through as big of a hump along the way. What that translates to, the reduction in the activation energy, what that translates to is that molecules can accumulate that energy more quickly and they can pass through the transition state to the product at a faster rate. In really simple words, catalysts, enzymes increase the, rate, increase the rate at which their chemical reactions are occurring. And they do it by reducing the activation energy. They reduce the speed bump that you need to pass over in order to get from the reactant to the product. So, let me do some audience participation. All right? I'm getting tired. I need a little break. Give me a breather here. I want you guys to consider this question. All right? and I'm going to ask you to turn and talk for like a minute or so with somebody sitting nearby. Uh, wrestle with this idea, and then I want to hear what answer you think is the best choice of those at the bottom. And I'm going to talk our way through the answer. But my question for you is this. I'm asking you to consider a catalyst happens to not be an enzyme, it's not a protein, right? it's just potassium iodide, right? but it's a catalyst, and it reduces the activation energy of converting uh, hydrogen peroxide 
to water and oxygen gas. Okay, so potassium iodide in the presence of, uh, of hydrogen peroxide will convert that hydrogen peroxide into a pretty bubbling solution where the bubbles coming out are oxygen gas. It's fun to see. Okay? It's got a net delta G of 75, or, or the transition state, the activation energy in the absence of potassium iodide is 75.3 kcals per mole. In the presence of potassium iodide, it gets reduced to 56.5 kcals per mole. Okay? So what would have been neat is if for this picture, I had shown this in black and that in red. Right? That would have been really clever on my part, wouldn't it? Because I'm telling you, in the absence of potassium iodide, to get over that hump, it's 75.3. In the presence of potassium iodide, it is 56.5. The question then is simply, how much faster is the catalyzed reaction than the uncatalyzed reaction? So take a minute, make a friend, talk to somebody next to you, see which of those five choices you think is the best answer. Okay? And I'm just going to sit here quietly while you guys talk. This is a chance for you to phone a friend. Right? What do you think? you guys five choices. I hope that you are arriving at an answer. How many of you think that A is a good choice? How many of you are, how many of you are too shy to raise your hand? <laughs> That's sort of an oxymoron, isn't it? Uh, well, nobody's biting on A. And that's good. That's where I'm, I'm trying to take you guys at this point. Uh, a is a bad choice. It's suggesting to you that the reaction is slower in the presence of potassium iodide. That sort of flies in the face of what catalysts are all about. It also flies in the face of the idea of what happens when you lower the activation energy. Kind of the same thing. So it shouldn't be slower. If you've changed the activation energy, could the rate of the reaction stay the same? Anybody like B as a choice? Don't all shout out at once, right? I'm not getting any takers for B. Now, I want you to think about how I could have changed the question so that B was the right answer. That's the kind of trick I do on the exams, right? You look at the old test and you say, gee, one year this was the right answer, now this year this is the right answer, the question's the same, what's going on? And I say, ah, no, no, the questions aren't quite the same, I've changed a word or two. How do I change the question to make B the right answer? Diabolical, that's you know, like the way I like to think about what I'm doing to you when I do that sort of thing. What do I do to change that question? How about if I asked, instead of how much faster is the reaction, how much different or how different is the delta G associated with the reaction. How about that? All right, because then the answer is the same. It's not any different. The delta G is the same for this reaction, whether it's catalyzed or not. So again, diabolical is the way that I like to think of how that plays out. But that's not the question that I'm, being, that I'm putting to you here. This is just a bad choice because when you lower the activation energy, you're going to change the rate. We know it's not going to be less. We know it's not going to be the same. The reaction's going to be faster. So what do you guys think? We've narrowed down our choices. There's now C, D, and E. What do you guys think? How many of you like C? How many of you like D? How many like E? I don't know. It seems to me that C and E are roughly equal, and D looks like it's a loser amongst you guys. You know what? There are actually mathematical formula that you could plug the activation energies into 
that would tell you precisely how much faster the reaction is. And then you can bear that out. You can you know, put it in a test tube and you can verify that it's the case. A lot of this thermodynamics has really been distilled down to math, such that that difference, those two values for the activation energy, you can plug it into an equation and it would tell you exactly how much faster the reaction is. All I care about right now is that you guys realize it's something like C, D, or E. All right? That's good enough for where we are. I'm not going to ask you to work with those equations or even learn those equations. It's nice that you might know that those equations exist. But more importantly, it's nice that you know if you lower the activation energy, you increase the rate of the reaction. Now, I happen to know that the rate of the reaction increases by a rate by 1,687 fold. So E is actually the right answer for this particular scenario. But ultimately, what's going to drive what is the right answer is the difference between the activation energy without the catalyst and the activation energy with the catalyst. The bigger the difference, the faster the rate at which the reaction will take place. About a thousand-fold increase in the rate of a reaction is kind of the norm for an enzyme-catalyzed reaction. Right? So if somebody asks you to just spitball or take a guess for any given enzyme, how fast, what's the rate at which substrate gets converted to product, it's about a thousand-fold faster for the catalyzed reaction relative to the uncatalyzed reaction. That's just a good ballpark estimate. Okay? There are some enzymes that are phenomenally good, right? like 40 million times faster rate of conversion of substrate to product than the non-catalyzed reaction. But as a norm, they're about a thousand-fold faster. So in the half an hour or so we've got left, <clears throat> I want to talk with you guys now about how it is that enzymes can pull this off, right? You know, I've been talking about rolling balls up steps and things like that. At a molecular level, how is it that an enzyme gets two reactants or one reactant to that transition state with less of an investment of energy? I showed you this picture on Tuesday, and I said, Come on, seriously, do you need that uh, thing on the left there that's pointing to that cleft to tell you that's where the active site is? I mean, come on, there's got to be something interesting that's happening there. That, doesn't, that sort of weird structure just isn't going to happen by chance. And I tell you what, you know, maybe it's me having looked at these structures for years now, but all the rest of this stuff is there pretty much just to make this happen. Okay. You know, and I look at this and I think, you know, there might be something interesting happen over here, happening over here, too. That looks suspicious, right? But, oh, my gosh, there's something that's happening over here. And the way that this enzyme is going to be reducing the activation energy associated with this substrate or this reactant is by pulling that substrate in, making it a nice, comfortable spot for this to nestle up against, right? Hydrophobic patch for hydrophobic patch, positive charge for negative charge, just a nice cuddly spot for that molecule to sit. A lot of times people talk about glove in hand or a lock in key, right? It's the glove, oh, what a happy coincidence that gloves are shaped perfectly to fit over our hands, right? It's not a coincidence. People designed the gloves with that in mind. It's not a coincidence that that substrate can fit into that spot on the surface of the protein. If you're a creationist, God set it up that way. If you're not so much of a creationist, it's because natural selection and evolution have fine-tuned the system and given the nod to the molecules that fit, or the enzymes that brought in those substrates better than the competing organisms' enzymes were bringing in the substrates, right? So that's how it's going to happen. And then look also at the difference in the structure, and, and this is, you know, there's no hyperbole. This is the way these things work out. Once the substrate's in the site, notice how the enzyme's shape changes. The enzyme is actually wrapping itself around the substrate. The substrate's happy to be there. The enzyme's happy to be there. You know, it's hugging the substrate. Right? It's not just got open arms. It's got open arms that once you come in for the hug, you get the, the embrace as well. 
That's what's going on at a molecular level. That change in the shape of the enzyme is important. Remember, in biology, structure and function are intimately related. You change the shape of something, you're probably going to change its function. In this context, it's so important that biochemists have bothered to give that phenomenon a name, this idea that an enzyme changes its shape in response to something, the presence of a substrate, the presence of other molecules. The change in shape, which in turn results in a change in function, gets a name. It's called allosterism. It's an allosteric effect. I don't know what the Latin or Greek roots of the words are. Steric is like the shape in some sense. Allo is a different, I suppose. Allosterism is this phenomenon that you see taking place here where the shape of the enzyme has changed in response to the presence of some other molecule. Here the molecule happens to be the substrate. That's an allosteric effect. The substrate had an allosteric effect on the enzyme. And again, when the shape changes, you should fully expect that that's going to have some functional consequence. So I promised you that I was going to explain to you how it is that you changed the activation energy, how an enzyme gains the system and changes the activation energy. Here is a schematic example, one of a number of different ways that an enzyme could reduce an activation energy, but it's, it illustrates the point. You got an enzyme. Seriously, do you need this little thing here telling you that's where the active site is? This is like a cartoon rendering of an active site. It's like, uh, you know, the nose is huge, right? Just to draw attention to the fact that there's something interesting happening there. You got an active site. Notice how the cartoonist here has chosen to draw the active site. It's got a little poking in part over here. It's got a smaller poking in part over here with a different shape, right? Check out what the substrates are. You got a green substrate and a red substrate. The red substrate has a poking out rounded thing that fits neatly into that spot on the active site. The green substrate has a poking out thing that fits neatly into that part of the active site. You see what's happening here? If the poking out parts are not just shape, it could be just shape of the molecule, but let's say there's a little more juice to this. It's not just shape, but also complementary charges or complementary hydrophobicities or hydrophilicities, right? Such that this tip of the point is a positive charge and at the bottom of the, the depression here is a negative charge. This molecule nestles up and fits snugly and comfortably on that spot on the surface of the enzyme, just as this molecule can nestle up and fit comfortably on that spot of the enzyme. Now remember, this enzyme is catalyzing a reaction that has a favorable delta G. That means the reaction is one that would take place even if the enzyme wasn't there. The trick is, is the enzyme is making the reaction take place faster by reducing the activation energy. So what that means is the red thing and the green thing floating around in a watery environment should be able to bump into each other in just the right way that as a result of that collision, they depart as something other than the red thing and the green thing, okay? But because that active site is providing a nice, stable, comfortable spot for the red thing and for the green thing, all you need to have happen really now is instead of random motion and getting these two molecules to bump into each other in just the right way, you can bring in a red thing and have it sit there and then attract in a green thing to this comfortable spot and it doesn't have to worry about random Brownian motion to bump into it. The red thing's already sitting there. It's got a nice, comfortable seat. It's so much easier to have these two molecules bump into each other if one of them is already sitting down nice and comfortable. When you're going to a bar, it's a lot easier to meet people at the bar than on the dance floor, right? Because they're sitting down with a drink, right? It's an easier target for you to attack or to approach 
than if you're trying to bump into somebody walking around on the dance floor. All right, maybe not my best analogy, but I think you get the idea, right? That's the magic, that's the game that's going on here with this enzyme. Is it's made it a nice, comfortable spot for both those molecules to sit such that when one is there, the other one, it stays there until the other one comes along. So once they're both in place, not necessarily because of any trick at that point that the enzyme has done, these molecules would have undergone this reaction in and of their own volition. This is just the sort of thing those molecules would do if they were in the proper orientation relative to each other. But because the enzyme has held them there, they're in the right orientation, they convert from these substrates to these products, and then the products are allowed to fall out, and what do you get? You're back to an enzyme that's waiting for more customers, waiting to do more matchmaking. Okay? And the cycle just goes over and over again. Enzymes reduce the activation energy. Right? You could have accomplished the same thing by heating up that solution so that they moved around faster, because the faster they're moving, the better the chances are that they'll bump into each other. Right? Standing still, you don't have much chance of bumping into another molecule or somebody on the dance floor, right? Moving around faster, you got a better chance that you'll have some collisions, right? So you could have accomplished the same thing by increasing the energy, here the activation energy, increasing the temperature, or you could have facilitated that interaction and thereby reduced the energy that's needed for those two molecules to come together and hit each other in just the right way. That's what enzymes do. The net result of this is a lowered activation energy and speed. It happens a lot faster, thousands of times faster than it would have happened, sometimes millions and tens of millions of times faster than it would have happened in the absence of a catalyst. All right, so that's how enzymes do their thing. Let me talk with you a little bit about how we put enzymes to work to actually get lots of useful things done. We've got here a glance, a superficial look at an important metabolic pathway. It turns out that you and I and a lot of other living things need to have this red thing at the bottom of the screen. That's a particular amino acid called isoleucine. Okay, there are 20 amino acids, right? One of them has the name isoleucine. You can't make proteins unless you got some isoleucine around to string together as part of the protein that you're making, all right? If you don't know what I'm talking about, just accept the fact you gotta have isoleucine. This is a molecule we need, okay? Where do you get isoleucine? There's two ways you could get isoleucine. You could eat it and take it from something else, or you could roll up your sleeves and get to work and make the darn thing yourself, right? From scratch. Ultimately, you might be able, something's gotta make it from simple things like carbon dioxide, ammonia, and water, right? The way that you and I make isoleucine when we decide to make it as opposed to decide to eat it, the way we make isoleucine is we start with threonine, another amino acid. And we convert threonine into isoleucine, energetically a favorable reaction. Do I need to tell you that? It'll be energetically favorable to go from here to here, but we do it in a stepwise fashion that involves, what, five different enzymes. We convert the threonine into something else, another enzyme converts that to something else, another enzyme converts that to something else, another enzyme converts that to something else, and then finally a fifth enzyme converts that thing into what we wanted at the end of the process. This is a metabolic pathway, and this is fairly common. A lot of, you, we'll see a lot of examples of this, where you start with a substrate, you end up with a product, but it happens in a two, three, four, sometimes 10 step or even more process, right? We're moving things along slowly, but ultimately in the right direction. So that's a metabolic pathway. Look how nicely the threonine fits into the active site of the enzyme, right? At the beginning of the process, enzyme one. Let me ask you this. 
what do you suppose happens when we've got a lot of isoleucine in our cells? Right? I'm telling you, living things are mind-bogglingly well-designed organisms. I mean, just the, the schemes, the pathways, the processes are crazily, intricately, beautifully designed. If you've already got a lot of isoleucine floating around inside of your cells, what that means in fairly simple terms is you got enough isoleucine. Stop it already. Don't make any more isoleucine. I got isoleucine. You know what? Maybe we need threonine. You know? Let's just keep our powder dry at the very least. Maybe later on I'm going to want some isoleucine. Right now I got plenty. Maybe there's something else we should be doing with that threonine. Wouldn't it be swell? Wouldn't it make a lot of sense if cells were able to tell, you know what? We got enough isoleucine. I'm not going to make any more. This is a beautiful pathway. The catalysis is elegant, and the energetics, and the reduction in the activation energy is a nice piece of work. I just don't happen to need it right now. Wouldn't it be nice if, when you had a lot of isoleucine, you could go back to the beginning of the process and tell that first enzyme, whose name is threonine deaminase, you know, hold, hold off. You know, don't, don't send things down this pathway. Don't send things down this pipeline anymore. I'm good. I got the isoleucine that I need, right? And wouldn't it be neat if you were going to try to do something like that, give that sort of feedback to the beginning of the process, wouldn't it be nice if the feedback actually came at the beginning of the process as opposed to somewhere in the middle or at the very end, right? This molecule, it doesn't do you nearly as much good if it comes back and it tells this enzyme to stop doing its thing. Where you really want it to tell, stop doing your thing, it's this one up here at the beginning. Before the horse gets out of the barn, right, close the door. How about that for an analogy? Right? We live in an agricultural part of the state. You guys know what barns are. You know what horses are. It works. Right? You want to do this at the beginning before the horses have left. Okay? Well, where do you suppose this is all going? You guys are like two minutes ahead of me at this point because there's more to this slide. The left-hand side of the screen shows you a phenomenon known as feedback inhibition. The end product of that pathway goes back. It's a molecule that can go back to the beginning of the pathway and can, in some sense, communicate to that first enzyme, ah, enough already. Isn't that pretty? Would you have designed this system any differently? Maybe you would have designed it, designed it less well. <laughs> if you were snoozing or drunk or whatever, you might have designed it less well than this. But is there a way that you could have designed the system better? I can't think of anything. I mean, that's exactly rationally, logically, the way that this should be set up. If you've made enough of the product at the end of this pathway, it'd be really nice if something, and why not the thing at the end of the pathway, but if something could come back to the first step in the process and say, oh, okay, hold off, enough already, we're good. Don't bother with making us any more isoleucine. And look how that happens. It happens that isoleucine is able to interact with another spot on the surface of threonine deaminase. There's the active site that threonine can sit comfortably in, but there's another spot over here that isoleucine can sit comfortably in. And when isoleucine is sitting on its spot, what happens? An allosteric effect. The shape of the enzyme, threonine deaminase, changes when isoleucine is present. And when its shape changes, the threonine deaminase shape changes, included with that allosteric effect is a change in the active site of threonine deaminase such that it's no longer very receptive or welcoming to threonine. If threonine can't bind or isn't disinclined to bind to the active site, nothing's going to happen. And you've stopped the whole process. That's feedback inhibition. You see this for almost every metabolic pathway. 
There's going to be something like that, a feedback loop. We got enough already, stop. We also see here for the first time an instance where a molecule is acting, in the technical term is, as an inhibitor. So we've got something now that we've made the enzyme three enine deaminase. It's there, but the, it's important to bear in mind that living things can turn that enzyme off. Right? We've got a molecule here that can effectively prevent the enzyme from doing its thing. The enzyme is still there. If ever the isoleucine levels go down and the isoleucine comes off of its binding site, the enzyme's gonna come back to its active conformation and it'll be able to catalyze the reactions again. So the enzyme's there. We haven't thrown it away. We haven't killed it. It can still do its thing. But this is an example of inhibition. If molecules can act as inhibitors, I hope you'll also accept that other molecules can act as activators. It's a yin-yang kind of thing. Sometimes we turn enzymes on. Sometimes we turn enzymes off, right? Some enzymes can be both turned on and turned off by different molecules. But there you go. That's an instance of inhibition and specifically feedback inhibition. Let's talk about a couple other things. Look at that word, allosteric. See, I didn't make that up. The textbook has a figure that has it in it. And we'll also talk a little bit about cooperativity. Here we have an enzyme that works as a tetramer. That means there are four proteins identical that need to come together in order for any of them to be able to catalyze the reaction. So it's a tetramer. Four copies of the protein need to interact with each other. And this is an interesting sort of point here. You know, when we're looking at cartoons, when we're looking at pictures and books, we tend to think of these as very static, like snapshot, but that's the way it is, locked in place. But what you really should be doing is appreciating that molecules are always wiggling and kind of twitching and moving around. And here the word oscillation is used to, dis to suggest to you that sometimes the enzyme has its active sites displayed in one particular way, sometimes it has them displayed in another particular way. And it can go back and forth of its own accord by doing that. Here, what we've got is a molecule that when it interacts with the tetramer in this conformation, locks it into place so that it can't wiggle anymore. And here it happens to lock it into place in a way that keeps the active sites from being receptive to the substrate. So it's an, it is an inhibitor. It's preventing the substrate from getting to the active site if the substrate can't bind the active site, the catalysis can't take place, you've turned that enzyme off, right? But at the top, you can see another molecule that can wedge itself in a different spot on the surface of this tetramer, this quaternary structure, going back to the first part of the class. It can wedge itself in in a different way that locks the tetramer into a conformation whereby the active site is very open and receptive to the substrate. So here we have an activator, whereas before we were just talking about an inhibitor. There's another way that you can sort of turn enzymes on and turn enzymes off. And then lastly, there's this neat idea of cooperativity. It has interesting implications for the rate at which these reactions take place, but sometimes the presence of a substrate in a tetramer like this, that itself has an allosteric effect that influences the shape of the active sites on other parts of the tetramer and facilitates their binding substrate as well. So that's why the word cooperativity is used. I'm not that worried that you guys can give a specific example of cooperativity. And I'm not that worried that you guys could you know, hone in on the importance of oscillation and such. I'm hoping you guys come away from what I've been talking with you about here with the appreciation that enzymes increase the rate at which reactions take place because they lower activation energies, right? And I'm hoping you also come away now appreciating that you can change the shape of an enzyme in a way that sometimes increases 
its ability to act as a catalyst. And sometimes you change its shape in a way that reduces its ability to act as a catalyst. And then along the way, there's these neat concepts like cooperativity and feedback inhibition that come into play as well. We're in the home stretch. Uh, here are, are some graphs that come from your textbook. The top one here gives you the idea that for human enzymes, a typical human enzyme works best, believe it or not, at body temperature, right? But other organisms have enzymes that are designed in such a way, or put together in such a way, that they actually work best at other than body temperatures. So if you take an organism that lives at a deep sea vent where the water temperature can be more than 100 degrees centigrade, it shouldn't be too surprising to hear that its enzymes have been adapted to function best at higher temperatures. And so the top one here shows you that, oh, look at that. Our enzymes don't work as well when you boil them. Right? Uh, but other organisms' enzymes that live in boiling water uh, actually fare better. They work better, they catalyze reactions better at higher temperatures. And what other, what other sorts of things can change the shape of an enzyme? Well, the temperature, I think you can imagine, would have an effect on the shape of an enzyme. I've already tried to impress upon you in the first part of the course that pH can have an effect on the shape of an enzyme. And sure enough, we see indications of this all over the place. Enzymes work best at a particular, fairly narrow range of pH. Pepsin is an enzyme that works in our stomachs where the pH is very low, right? Its optimum pH is at about two. Uh, if you put it in an environment where the pH was five or six or even seven, uh, that might be comfortable for the rest of our bodies, you shouldn't be expecting pepsin to have any enzymatic activity. It's not going to work well as a catalyst. It's just not in the right shape. And in contrast, trypsin works better in your intestines where the pH is more like 8. And again, if you took trypsin and you put it into the stomach, that change in pH would change the structure of the enzyme. That would change the function. It turns out changing the function in a way that causes it to have little, if any, function. All right, so where are we going with all this stuff? On Tuesday of next week, I'm going to talk with you about half of metabolism. Remember in the lecture on Tuesday, I began by showing you all of metabolism. You guys are ready to handle half of it now. I'm going to talk with you specifically about catabolism, how it is that you break molecules down to extract energy from them, ultimately. And then on Thursday, I'm going to talk with you about anabolism, okay? So again, we're right now talking about, you know, we, metabolism is a big thing. We're going to wrap our arms around things particularly related with energy metabolism. We're going to talk specifically about how it is instead of lighting a match and blowing up things like hydrogen gas and releasing the energy in one big poof, you do it in a stepwise fashion so that we can gradually capture that energy and save it as ATPs, as opposed to just a bunch of heat and a bunch of light. And so what you've all been waiting for, you've got five minutes today to photograph it or to write it down. Here's a question that I propose will be on your second exam for this class, word for word. You've got to fig figure out what the answers might be, but I've got a question for you right there. That's all i got for you for today. Have a good weekend, and I'll see you on Tuesday.